started. All right, so welcome back everybody for another year of school. Uh, this is uh, CIS 220 system level programming. Uh, I think most of you know who I am from CIS 124. I'm Dr. Burton Ma. Uh, if you need to find me, I'm in Goodwin in office uh, in room 754. Uh, office hours, I haven't settled on office hours yet this year. Um, I'll uh, put them on on queue as soon as I uh, have finalized hours. Email. So I tell students this every year. If you're going to email me, that's fine. There's my email address, right? But please put CIS220 in the subject line so that I know what course you're talking about because otherwise I don't know what course you're talking about and I teach more than one course per term. And the courses I teach are very large, so it's actually very hard for me to find out what course are you in if you just send me some, some email saying something that I can't figure out immediately from the email, what course you're in. I have to go look up the class list and then I have to look at like 500 students to figure out who you are. It's very uh, time consuming and annoying. So please, this 220 in the subject line if you email me. Uh, you can grab a seat if you want. There are seats available. As you can tell, we are at capacity in this room. So um, uh, if you want a, the pick of seats, you have to show up a little bit early. Oh, and there's more people coming. All right. Teaching assistants. So there are five, I think, four or five teaching assistants. Their contact information will be posted on OnQ later this week once we have all the contracts settled. Uh, they will have virtual office hours, so on Teams, uh, one hour a week per TA or something like that, uh, where you can contact them for help on the course material or mostly the assignments. If you have any questions about the way the course runs, so administration, stuff like that, you should contact me. The TAs don't know anything about how the course runs or, and they don't have any access. Uh, they don't have administrative access to OnQ, so they can't change stuff on OnQ. They can't change your marks or things like that. They can change your assignment marks. They can't change uh, your test marks or things like that. Okay, so everything's on OnQ, or will be on OnQ. Lectures are recorded. All of last year's lecture slides are online, already on OnQ. Um, and I'll talk more about how the lectures will work in just a second. So there's no required textbook in the course, which is good because there's actually two major topics in the course, so you'd have to buy two textbooks. Uh, there's a full set of Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, they're all on, well, they will be online. They have to be updated for this year. Uh, but they will be online later this week, hopefully, to, uh, hopefully today or tomorrow, uh, where you can get all of the course information that you need. Uh, almost everything that you need for the course is in the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, so if you don't want to read the Jupyter Notebook, that would, be, uh, that would definitely be one way to do this. Uh, course notes. Uh, there are a set of course notes written by Dr. David Lamb. Uh, they are freely available to you. Uh, they are very terse. So it's not really a text. Basically, here's some information and that's it. There's no examples or anything. There's no exercises, nothing like that. Uh, if you want uh, reference books, uh, the library has many excellent resources available to you for free. Uh, if you don't mind an online textbook. Uh, the two that I recommend uh, for this course are the Linux command line and Effective C. Uh, those links hopefully work. I haven't checked those links, uh, so hopefully they work. If they don't work, I'll uh, update them in the lecture slide, in the slides, um, or you can just search the library uh, for those two books. Uh, the book is uh, the Effective C book is quite good. Grading. Okay, so let's look at grading, because that's the part most of you are probably interested in for today. All right, so there's your course description if you want to look at it. Uh, information about the textbook is there. Your grading scheme is here. And there's your grading scheme. All right, so it's uh, six assignments. First assignment has a slightly lower weight than the rest. Um, there's two tests. They are in class. Uh, if I remember, this room is going to suck for writing a test in. Um, they're both worth 15%. And then there's an exam. 25%. Uh, the, there should be something here. So there's a, a, uh, an assignment. Wait a minute, maybe this is in the lecture slide. Hang on. Let's see. Oh, here they are. Okay, so the assignments. So the assignments are all supposed to be done individually. You submit them on, on queue, right? So same as CIS 124. Uh, there is a universal accommodation policy for the assignments. So again, similar to CIS 124. Right, so every assignment has an official due date. 
right? The expectation is you get your work done, you submit it by the due date. However, you may submit without penalty and without contacting me or the TA. That's the important part. Do not contact me or the TA and tell me it's going to be late, right? Because I don't care, right? And I don't want all your emails telling me they're going to be late because I'll get like 100 of them, right? So up to three days, you may submit, no penalty, right? After those three days, though, the assignment shall not be Right? Unless you have, uh, there are some students with academic accommodations who occasionally need more than three days. Right? Those students, uh, you should know by now, you should know by now, you have to contact your instructor and ask if you can have more than the, um, in this case, the three days uh, of an extension. Right? Uh, so if you are one of those students, uh, contact me and normally the answer is sure, just submit it when you're, uh, just submit it within like a week or something like that. Uh, quizzes are in class, uh, they are non they, uh, they're in class, sorry. So they're in person, they are written, which kind of sucks, but that's, why, that's how it works. Um, the dates are on on cue, uh, if you missed them already. All right, so Tuesday, October 3rd, 10.30 in class, and then Tuesday, November 14th, 10.30 in class. Anybody in here in SIFT 124 this term? A few of you? Yeah, okay, so that's... So the recommended course of action is to not take SIFT 124 and SIFT 220 at the same time uh, for several reasons. Normally, uh, there's some stuff in SIFT 220 where we kind of assume that you've done it already in SIFT 124. Normally, that's not a problem because that happens later in the course. Uh, the other problem is SIFT 124 and SIFT 220, the dates, uh, all the times this term, they're all in the morning. Uh, and so it's hard to schedule quizzes for both courses where you don't write them on the same day or one day after another. So if you're in 124 and 220, uh, your quizzes are back to back on days, which is better than last term because the last term they were on the same day. <laughs> so at least you have a day in between uh, this year. Uh, this year right? But there's no good way for me to schedule quizzes uh, for the both courses so that you have like a week or something in between. Uh, 124 is particularly awkward because Monday class, which is at 10.30, there's a lot of holidays on the Monday class, uh, and so it, it just messes up. All right, so if you're in that your load may be a little bit heavier than you would like, right? Nope. Exam, the exam, it's an in-person exam scheduled by the exam office. It's a two-hour exam. It's not a three-hour exam. It's not comprehensive, right? So uh, it's similar to, wait, no, wait. Uh, so the second part is not comprehensive. So it only covers stuff from the second half of the course, right? So you don't need to remember stuff from the first half of the course on the exam. All right, so what is this course all about? So it's called System Level Programming. Right? And so what that really means is that um, in your previous courses, you were programming in what are called uh, high-level languages. Uh, they're actually quite high-level languages, right? So Python and Java, right? So in Python and Java, when you write a statement of a line of code, uh, for a lot of stuff that you would normally write in those languages, if you actually see the sequence of machine instructions that run when you write those lines of code, there's a lot. Right? So for example, if you print something in Java, Java's print statement's great. Print, blah, and it just prints it. Right? You don't care what the blah is. You can print whatever you want. Uh, you'll see very quickly when you do the C part of this course, printing stuff is not so easy. Right? If you want to print an integer, you have to tell C to print an integer. If you want to print a double, you have to tell C to print a double. Right? If you make up your own type, you have to tell C how to print your own type. Right? And so the languages that you use in this course, they operate at a lower level than the languages that you used previously. Right? Uh, and you'll see that in the C course, that a lot of the stuff that you just take for granted in the language like Python or Java is actually very hard to do. Right? Or takes an unusually large number or an unexpectedly large number of lines of code to achieve. Right, so we're working at a lower level of abstraction in this course than you worked at in uh, SIFT 121 and 124. Right? So you're going to learn about the, what are called these Unix-like operating systems. Basically, you're going to be working in an operating system called Linux. I'll talk more about that in just a second. Right? You're going to be doing some scripting language stuff. 
So we're going to use a language called Bash, right? And where you're going to interact with the operating system. So you're going to write Squirter Jest program, right? Uh, which ex executes some sequence of steps to solve some problem uh, in Linux. And then you're going to learn the C language, um, which uh, we'll encounter in the second half of the course. Right, and of course, uh, this is all programming, so you're going to do some software development stuff as well. All right, so uh, we're going to be using this operating system called Linux. So what's an operating system? You all know what an operating system is. Well, you all interact with an operating system, right? So if you're using Windows or Mac. Some of you might be using Linux on your computers. That's the blue box right here. That's your operating system. Right? Your operating system is the software that talks to your computer hardware, right? So your CPU, your disks, your network, everything else that you plug into your computer, right? Uh, for all that stuff to work, right? Uh, you need an operating system, right? And the operating system makes those services available to whatever programs are running on your computer. Right? So if you're using PowerPoint or your web browser or something like that, right? That's your green box here, right? Whenever, well, not whenever, Often when it's doing something, it needs to talk to the operating system to get something done, right? It needs to read a file, it needs to read the network, right? It needs to draw something, something like that, right? And that all interacts with the operating system. And you are the orange box at the top, right? You're the one that interacts with the application, right? And that's the way most people use their computers, right? And of course, uh, you are also going to be interacting with the operating system. Right. Okay, so the way you're gonna do this, uh, through what's called a command line, right? And so most of your experience with uh, computers, it's all been graphical, right? Uh, and I guess a lot of kids these days, that's their only interaction with them, right? They got an iPad, they just click and move things around and stuff like that, right? Most of you have used a desktop computer, I assume, right? So you're used to pointing and clicking and typing th things in, right? So in this course, uh, there's not so, you're not gonna be using a graphical user interface at all, right? Everything is through a command line interface. Right, which means you get a box that looks something like this, where you type commands in and stuff happens. Right, and so that's a bit of a change for most of you. Uh, so you'll have to get used to doing that. Right? Most of this course involves using that command line interface to interact with uh, an operating system of some kind. All right, so what is this thing called Linux? Well, it's just an operating system. Right? If you want to read, find out more about it, you can click on the link and read about it. Right, uh, uh, I'm not going to ask you about anything in this link, right? So don't feel obligated to take notes and stuff like that. It's not necessary, right? But if you're curious, you can find out about Linux, right? Uh, but in brief, it's a free, as in beer, uh, op open source operating system, right? So anybody can grab it. They can install it on their computers if their computer cooperates, right? Uh, it is very, very, very widely used in industry, right? So um, most of the network infrastructure on the internet, right, your servers, uh, all powered by Linux. Not all of it, most of it is powered by Linux, right? Some of it is powered by Windows, none of it is powered by Mac, right? So it's all Linux, mostly Linux. Okay. Um, it's using these things called mainframes, which none of you, I think, have seen before. These are basically giant computers. By giant, I mean like room sized computers. Um, that are, are primarily used by financial institutions. Right? Supercomputers, so these are typically nowadays networks of many, many, many computers. Most of them are powered by Linux. Right? A lot of embedded devices, so these are typically computers that are inside some device. You don't see it or anything like it. You just, op you just interact with the device. Uh, and these are called embedded devices. A lot of those, but not all of them, powered by Linux. The operating system is technically good at Linux, uh, but everybody just has Linux. Okay. All right, so you need to use Linux in this course. So how are you gonna do that given that most of you are not using Linux? Is anybody here actually using Linux on their computer? There's always like one or two. Yeah, okay, so there's a few of you. All right, so if you want to, you can use CastLab. So if you go into CastLab, there are a small number of computers set up. Uh, they I believe they're all dual boot, so they're all Windows Linux dual boot. Uh, you can just go into the Linux operating system and you will get a perfectly functional Linux operating system that you can work with if you want to work at school. It's true. Your students don't want to work at school. Uh, and so 
Uh, what are you going to do at home? All right, so how many of you are using Mac? Yeah, it goes up every year. So it used to be like 5%, and now it's like half the class, right? Okay, so if you're using Mac, good luck, right? No, I'm kidding. So if you're using Mac, if you're using Mac, there's almost, there's very little that you have to do to get your computer set up for, uh, to, to use this course, right? Uh, you have to install a little bit of software, and away you go. So Mac OS is actually, oh, what the heck's it built on now? Oh, I forget, I have a, it's in the morning. I can't. Mac OS is um, built on a system which is close enough to Linux for our purposes, right? And so if you go onto your Mac computer and open a terminal application, you will get something that looks like that, and you can type commands into that uh, and they will work, right? And so, uh, you need to do a little bit of stuff to get Mac working properly for this course, but it's not so bad. Uh, if you're on Windows, Excuse me. If you're in Windows, then the easiest way to do this is to install the uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, which should work on any modern-ish uh, computer. Modern-ish, I mean like circa 2014 or later, right? Because that's what I have at home. My computer is like 10 years old. It runs everything just fine. Right, so as long as you're running Windows 10 or preferably 11 nowadays, uh, this is fine, right? I'm gonna post some instructions on how to set up either a Mac or Windows. Uh, I have to update them for this year because some software has changed. So I have to update that later this afternoon and I will post uh, those pages today. They ready? Don't follow the instructions yet because they may not work. I have to make sure that they work. Um, but otherwise, you can get your stuff set up in a way you want. I think the Windows instructions are fine because they, they just link to the uh, Microsoft documentation. All right. Uh, so, what are you going to be doing in this course? Well, you're going to be interacting with the command line. Right? Uh, so you're going to be interacting in something that looks like this. Right? Uh, so basically the way this thing, this is a terminal, right? Inside this, uh, this is a terminal program. It's actually a terminal emulator program, right? Inside this terminal emulator program, it's running something called a shell, right? The shell is a program that will read whatever I type into my terminal, like ls, right? And it will try to interpret that as a command, right? So basically, I'm asking the operating system to do something right now, right? ls means list the contents of the current directory, and voila, there you go, right? And so you press enter, and you get a listing of all the files that are in this current directory, right? Or folder, as most of you probably call them. Right? Uh, and so you can run all sorts of commands, right? How many commands are there? There's like, uh, on my computer right now, there's something like 500 commands, right, uh, that you can interact with directly via the terminal, right? Is there anybody who actually knows what all 4,500 commands are? The answer is no, right? Do you have to know what all 4,500 commands are by the end of this course? The answer is no, right? You need to know like 20 of them or something like that. So it's not that big a deal, right? But it's a completely different way of interacting with your operating system, right? Uh, in this course, most of the commands that you'll be using is going to be actually to do some work. Right, but there are stupid commands as well. Right, so you just saw ls, right? ls is probably one of the most commonly used commands that you would use when you're interacting with the command line interface, right? Because uh, often you wanna know what are the files in this directory, right? If I change directories, I need to know, I might wanna know what are the files in this directory, right? So it's very common to use ls, right? Uh, what happens if you type in sl accidentally, right? So typing stuff in accidentally is not unusual, right? So lls. Right, well, there is no command called LLS. And so this particular version of uh, Ubuntu asks you, maybe you want one of these instead, right? What if you type in SL? Well, right, so some programmer in their copious free time thought it would be funny uh, to make a little program that has a train that goes across your screen when you type in SL, right? So this, is called, this program is called Steam Locomotive. Right? It's not normally installed by default on most Linux uh, operating systems. It certainly won't be installed on your Mac, but you can install it if you want to. Right? And there's a lot of other silly little programs uh, that you can run, right? So cow say, right? What does that do? Well, it prints a cow, right? That says a message, right? Okay, so it looks silly, right? Uh, but this is actually useful because 
when you use these programs, right, typically there's a way to get the program to do something else, right? So for example, CalSay has options that you can pass to it, right? So if I wanna look at the documentation for CalSay, I can use what's called a man page. We'll talk more about this later, but I'm just gonna pop this up now. Right, there's a command called man. Man is short for manual, right? Man CalSay gives you the manual for the CalSay program if such a manual exists. And it does, right? And it spits out all this stuff at you, right? If you've ever seen the phrase, rude word manual, right? This is where it comes from, right? You wanna know how something works? You can always look at the documentation for it, right? And you can see up here, under synopsis, it says there's CalSay and then there's all this funny stuff after it, right? There's all these minus somethings, right? And so I happen to know how to use CalSay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and do it. So I'm gonna do CalSay minus L, right? And that lists all of the different cows that you can use to print something, right? And so it says here, you can use a duck or an elephant or a skeleton. Where's uh, Hello Kitty's here, right? Dragon, uh, Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes is here, right? Yes, someone actually programmed this, right? Right, now how do I uh, make it actually use that particular uh, shape? Oh, well there's this, Option here, minus F. So, cow say, minus F. Uh, what do we want to do? Let's do Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. Oh. Right, and now you can get the Ghostbusters logo saying hello. Right? So there's an example of using an option to one of these commands, right? You can, you can make a command behave in a different way, right? Typically by passing in an option to it, right? Now, here's your problem, right? I told you there's like 4,500 commands on my computer. Each one of those commands has, probably has one, 10, some of them have a thousand options, right? How do you need to, know how, like, are, is anybody realistically expected to know how to use all the commands with all the options? The answer is no. Right, and that's why these man pages exist, right? They're there to document how to use these commands. Right, also the internet exists, so that may be easier, right? Just Google, how do I, right, how do I do this? Uh, and away you go. All right, so are there other silly programs? Sure, there's other silly programs, right? If you want your terminal to display the matrix-like thing, you can type in the command C matrix and you get this, right? Uh, what else is there? Uh, toilet. It's actually probably a toilet or something, right? Uh, so this, pro this command here uh, prints some text out in a banner form using ASCII art, right? And this program too has lots of options that you can pass to it. Uh, so, right, and you can find out about that, again, using its man page, right? So man toilet, and away you go, right? You get the command here, you have all the options here, and if you keep on reading, you can actually find out what each option does here. Right, you're gonna be doing a lot of this in this course, right, or a lot of Googling, right, to looking up, looking up stuff to find out how they work, right? What options do I need to use? How do I use the options? So on and so on and so forth. All right, what else is here? C matrix, fortune, oh, we'll look at that in a second. All right, so we're not done? Although it is hot in here, it would be nice to be done. All right, so as I said, the uh, course notes, they are all available to you in the form of Jupyter Notebooks. Many of the lectures, I'm just gonna be using the Jupyter Notebook lecture from, right? Not all of them, a lot of them, right? Uh, because they've written it once, it works. I can just run it in the notebook, uh, so why produce a set of slides as well? Right? Okay, uh, this talks about a virtual machine. There is no virtual machine this year, so I experimented with what's called a virtual machine last fall. Uh, it doesn't work that well. Uh, it's really slow. It often crashes. Uh, so for this year, um, you're going to want to probably either use Cast Lab or get the necessary software installed on your computer. Right. Okay, but if uh, the, the notebooks are will be available to you online, uh, hopefully today or tomorrow. Right. And so you just go online, use the notebooks. Um, if you actually used them last year in 124, they work the same way uh, this year, right? So in the notebooks, you can, uh, anything that's in gray, 
you can run the code that's there, right? So there's a command in Bash called echo, right? Echo just prints a string, right? So I can print the string, hello world. You press that little arrow there, it'll actually run that. So that actually, um, the magic that the, I'm not exactly sure how all this works. It's pretty amazing that this works, that you can do this in your browser, right? But this actually spins up a Bash shell, runs that command, uh, and outputs the result uh, back to the console. So there's echo for you, right? ls, we saw this command. It's the command that lists the contents of a directory for you, right? What happens if I run this in the bash shell? Well, it turns out it lists the contents of whatever directory this particular file happens to be in, right? So if you run that, you can see there's a whole whack of files here, right? Uh, and these are all the bash notebook files, right? Anything with an ipynb, that's a notebook file. And so you can see all those files are sitting in this directory here. You can do all this from the terminal as well, right? So this terminal is in the same directory that that notebook is in, right? So if I type ls here, it produces the same output uh, that was uh, that the notebook produced, right? So anything that you run in the notebook, you can run in the in a terminal as long as you're in the same directory, right? Okay, so there's a command called cat. Cat is short for concatenate or catenate, sorry. Cat reads a file, prints the contents of the file to the screen. Right? So if I have a file called animals.txt, uh, and I do, right, it's right there, right, I can print the contents of that file to the screen, right, using the cat command, right? So apparently the animals.txt contains four lines, cat, zebra, dog, and armadillo. Right? If I want to print the contents of a different file, I can specify a different file to print, right? And you run that and it says, hey, cat, fruit.txt, no such file or directory, right? So this is an example of what happens when you run a command and you give it the wrong inputs, right? So here there is no file called fruit.txt in the directory, so cat complains, right? And this is common for a lot of commands, right? Command needs the command name, sometimes, well, no, so there's often options that you can pass the command, and then it needs some data to work on, right? Most of the commands that you'll be using require a file, a file name, multiple file names, or a string uh, as inputs to the command, right? So there is no fruit.txt, right? You'll see on the next uh, cell, there's fruits.txt, so maybe that's the right file name, right? So if I change that to fruits.txt and run that, uh, indeed, you get a listing of fruits, right? Cat can print out more than one file at a time. So I can print out multiple files, one after the other, right? So that lists the contents of animals.txt and fruits.txt, right? And again, right, you can do all of this from your uh, command, uh, from your command, uh, from your terminal program. Right? So can, oh, sorry, right? Same output. It's actually easier to type it into your terminal because your terminal can autocomplete, right? So if I type A tab, nothing happened. Well, you get a B, right? But if I type A N and then the tab key, right, uh, enough to know, right? Hey, there's a file called animals.txt, right? I can automatically complete that when the user presses the tab key, right? If I just type in A, and press tab, it doesn't complete because there's multiple files that begin with an A. So it doesn't know which one you want, right? But if you keep on typing, it, it can figure it out, right? F, whoa, sorry. F tab, F R tab, no way you go. Whoa, sorry. Okay, so what else can you do? So a lot of the stuff, me working with in Linux. Well, so in the systems, most of the one of the fundamental design decisions in the operating systems is that all data is just text, right? So files in these operating systems tend to be primarily human readable text. It's obviously not when you start to use more sophisticated programs in these operating systems, right? So for example, if you were to use the equivalent of PowerPoint in Linux, the file that it saves is probably not all text, right? 
Um, it's probably saved in some other format, mostly to save space. Right? About one of the stuff that you're going to work with in the Unix-like operating systems is just text. Right? So it's not surprising that most of the commands, in the, well, I'm sorry, a lot of the commands in these operating systems are designed around processing text. Right? So I can sort the contents of animals.txt with the sort command. Right? So it reads the contents of animals.txt one line at a time, right? and sorts them, uh, sorts, each, sorts the output uh, lexicographically, so in dictionary order, line by line. Right, so now you get armadillo, cat, dog, zebra. Right. All right, so a couple, just a second ago, we saw what happens when you do cat animals.txt and poops.txt, right? You get the output of, you get the contents of animals, and then you get the contents of fruit, right? So one of the, one of the uh, very important concepts in these operating systems is that you can take the output of one command and send it to another command, right? We'll look at this in more detail shortly, right? But notice there's a vertical bar here. So that's the pipe operator in this shell. It takes this command, right? It runs that command, takes the output of that command, sends it to the next command, right? And so you can set up these long, what are called pipelines of commands to do very complicated, uh, to create a very complicated output simply by chaining together lots of simple commands. Right? Now in order for you to do this, you need to know what all the simple commands do. Right? And so that's another one of the uh, key, uh, one, of the un one, of the un one of the important concepts in, these, uh, in the Unix-like operating systems. The way these, the way the commands are designed on these operating systems is each command does one thing, right? And it tries to do it well, right? If you want to do something complicated, you string together commands, right? To produce the complicated output, right? You don't write a command, so you don't write your own program that does this complicated thing uh, to produce the output, right? You take all of these other little commands that someone's already created for you together uh, and produce your output, right? So here I can sort the contents of both files together, right, into alphabetical order. Right, now a lot of you are saying, well, this is dumb. Why do I need to sort stuff, right? And so teaching this course is that in the way most people use their computers, they don't care about stuff like this, right? But as soon as you start to do anything uh, related to system administration or administering something in the classroom, right? This stuff suddenly becomes important, right? So there's like 200 and something of you in this course, right? There's another 150 in 124, right? If I want the output of all students in the class, right? It's gonna be pretty useful to sort the output, right? I can sort by your student number, maybe I can sort by your last name or sort by your first name, right? If I had to work with these files uh, in just any old, with your names or your information all in some random order, right? It would be very hard to get anything done, right? But it turns out sorting these big text files is very useful. So is searching these big text files. So if I want to search for stuff in a text file, right? grep lets you search stuff based on a pattern, right? So if I want to search the file animals.txt for all animals that start with the letter A, I can type in this command. Right, so grep, this is the caret, shift six on most of your keyboards, right? A, that says list all of the lines in that start with an A. Oops, sorry. Right, so apparently there's only one. Right, if I want to find all the fruits that contain the letter P, I can grep for the P in fruits.txt. That tells you all the fruits that have the letter P in their name. Right, grep is very powerful. We're gonna look at this in a lot more detail later on. So you can search for all sorts of complicated patterns um, in files, right? Uh, so grep is an example of a program that uses another language as its input, right? And so the language that it uses is called a regular expression. Regular expressions are very frequently used in a lot of programming problems, right? Okay, here's the date command. This is 
very unimpressive on most computers these days, right? So the date command prints out the date, right? And you might say, well, that's not very useful because down here, right, in the bottom right-hand corner, right, I've got this little widget here that tells me the date and time, right? And on every one of your desktop computers, there's some sort of clock or calendar uh, app or applet that tells you your date and time, right? But back when, back when uh, computers were not first developed, but in the early days of computing, the way you would interact with the computer is via a keyboard and something that looked like, where'd it go? Uh, sorry, something that looked like this, right? This was actually not in the early, early days. In the early days, there was no electronic device whatsoever. You type on a keyboard, if you were lucky, it was hooked up to a printer. The printer would spit some stuff out and then you'd have to go read what was printed on the piece of paper, right? Um, then along came the terminal, right? Which is this thing here. So you'd got a, you got a TV or something that looked like a TV uh, and a keyboard hooked up to that TV and you'd type stuff into it. Right? Uh, and so I've lost my, oh, date, right? So back in the earlier days of computing, if you wanted to know what the date was, you either had to look at the physical calendar on your desk or your watch, if you were lucky enough to have a watch that told you the dates, right? Or you would type in the date command here and it would tell you. Right? Like every other command, well, not like every other, like most commands, there are options that you can pass to the date command. Right, so if I wanted uh, the date in some other format, right? So here it prints out something that looks like English, right? It gives you the time in and the time zone, right? If I wanted a more compact version of the date that a lot of people use, right? You can ask date to generate that other more compact version, right? Is there's a date program? It makes sense that there's a calendar program as well, and there is, right? And so if you want to know what does the month look like? or what does the year look like, or what does the week look like, you can ask Cal to print that out for you, right? Looks dumb, but this turns out to be surprisingly useful, especially when I'm planning your course for the year, right? Because I can use Cal to print out four months of the year, print it on a piece of paper, and I've now got a handy dandy uh, listing of the, 12, of the four months of the term, right? Which turns out easier than using like Excel or some other online program to try to manage stuff. It's often easy just to print stuff out, scribble stuff on a piece of paper, uh, and I can generate that calendar trivially, right? As long as I know what the cal command actually does, right? I can ask for a particular month, so I can ask for the month of January, right? I can ask for the entire year, right? And so on and so on and so on. It looks bad here because uh, it's running in a notebook, right? Um, Right, but in the terminal, well, in the terminal, as long as it's big enough, right, it looks better. All right. Okay, so here's a, to end things off, there's another silly little program, right? There's a program that you can install called Fortune. Uh, Fortune just prints out a random, called an adage. So this is just like a question or a saying or something like that, right? Now, hopefully this doesn't get me into trouble because there are some rude uh, sayings. Okay, so that's So a vivid and creative mind characterizes you. So that's nice, right? If you run this over and over again, it just creates something random. So on and so on, right? You maybe recognize scene and hide, right? So like any other command that, pr that generates text, you can take the command and send it somewhere else. I can take the output of fortune and send the cow say, and cow say will print out the uh, fortune, right? Uh, and then we saw a toilet earlier. So this, I don't remember if this works here. Does this work here? Oh, it wor does work here, but it looks awful. Okay, so uh, again, you can run the command fortune, send its output to another program like toilet, and that will, uh, and, and toilet will print out the saying using these big banners. Right? And so this is just a very quick example of some of the simple stuff you'll be doing uh, in this course. Right, so by week, by the end of the, I guess, second week, by the end of this week, you should be, you'll be using commands, right? By the end of the second week, you'll be able to do all sorts of other things, right? By the end of week five or six-ish, right? So by week, we're going to be done with Bash. Hold on, we're not quite done yet. So by the end of, uh, by, by, by reading week, we'll be done the first half of the course, right? So you'll be done Bash. 
The course then transitions into C. So after reading week, you'll be learning about the C programming language. Um, and then we'll wrap up, and that'll uh, end the course. All right, so I will see you again, I guess, Thursday. <laughs>